Good morning. I'm glad you're able to take some time to devote to worship. And what we're doing this week is the same thing as last week. We're going to be looking at John 20. Uh, it turns out a little bit differently, but we're using the same reading. Uh, John 20, uh, what's the story of Doubting Thomas, as it's commonly said. When it was the evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fears of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hands on his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet, yet have come to believe. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. A friend called me and wanted to know what I was doing with Doubting Thomas, and I knew exactly what she was getting at. We were coming up on, on Doubting Thomas Sunday. You see, there is a, a series of readings that the church uses for every Sunday of the year. It's a three-year uh, set of, of readings called the lectionary. And um, out of all of the richness and depthness of script, depths of scripture it covers, from Genesis to Revelation, it covers all the books of the Bible. There is one, one of the, and it follows like, as you'd expect, the, the holy days, like the readings around Easter about resurrection and Lent, and then the Christmas readings, and, and the prophets are, come up, and Advent, the time preparing. I mean, so it makes sense. Uh, uh, but there is one moment every year that is the exact same reading, and it's the Sunday after Easter. The Sunday after Easter is always Doubting Thomas Sunday. And... Um, which is just always a surprise to me. And so my friend was calling me because my friend had preached on this Sunday for many, many years. My friend is uh, serving as an associate pastor. Uh, the Sunday after Easter in, in larger churches commonly is also the senior pastor takes vacation Sunday. And so my friend had preached on Doubting Thomas Sunday many, many times and uh, was a little bit fried about it, wanted to know, well, what are you doing with it? Both of us wanted to avoid the common uh, Doubting Thomas sermon. You may have heard it. The, the, the common Doubting Thomas sermon goes something like this. But all the disciples were together after the resurrection, and Jesus came to them, and Thomas wasn't there. He said, Thomas didn't believe. Thomas needed special attention to believe, and Jesus ends up kind of chewing on him and saying, you know what, you, you, I'll do this for you, but but you just don't make a habit of it, right? And so don't be like Thomas. Don't try to demand special attention. You just believe just cause, right? And I've heard this sermon on Doubting Thomas before, and I, I don't like it. It doesn't seem to really hold uh, to what's actually happening in, the, in the, what the scripture says. And uh, I think it's just kind of lazy. It doesn't pay attention to the details. And, and those, those details matter. And so uh, my friend and I, we looked at this scripture together, patiently looking at the details. And uh, we came up with not just one, but two uh, sermons on Thomas. And so here we are. This is the second sermon on Doubting Thomas uh, this year, uh, looking at the, the details. And the reason that I want to look at Thomas twice in a row, Sunday, two Sundays in a row, is part of uh, to show that like, when you go and open the Bible, 
there's always more to read. There's always more to get there. There's always more details. And if only because you're bringing another uh, days of experience to what you're reading, like you're going to interact with it differently. There are more opportunities for you to hear God's word in it. And so I, we're going to take, this is our second Sunday, because last Sunday we focused on one very particular detail in the story of Doubting Thomas. We focused on touching the scars and what it means that wounds have been healed to become scars. And this Sunday we're doing something, we're looking at a completely different aspect of it. Same passage, but this time we're focusing on a word, how, how Jesus responds, what he says. And so uh, to get us back into the moment, uh, Jesus has been resurrected, comes to the disciples. He sees 10 of them. Uh, Thomas was out and about taking care of business. We don't know what that business was, but uh, just in the same way that Peter was always the one to speak up, Thomas was always the one to go out and do something. And so he very well could have been going out and trying to find people, figure out how they were gonna get out of the city. Like he's out dealing with things, right? And, and then the 12th disciple, uh, Judas, he, he wasn't hanging out with them. Um, so Jesus shows up, the 10 disciples see him, and Thomas comes back, and he doesn't believe that this has happened, and he says, unless I put my hand into the scar on the side, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus shows up, and he, that, that happens. And then Jesus says, uh, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Jesus calls a group of people, blessed. And that's a powerful word. What does it mean for, the, for people? Right? And, and Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And there's a real sense in which Jesus is talking to us. Right? Blessed are, are us. We are the people who have not seen and yet have believed. So, so what does that mean? Blessed. Right? We use that word bless often. We talk about like things are being a blessing in disguise, what a blessing, right? And, but we, we get kind of wishy-washy on what it means. Like if, I, if we bless a meal, does it taste better? If we bless a meal, does that increase its nutritional value? If we bless a meal, does that change the nature of the conversation that happens around it, right? What changes when we bless a meal? In the same way, when we bless a person, we're talking about blessing a person. What well, do we? How do we even phrase it? Do we bless a person? Do we ask for a person to be blessed? All right? How how do, how do we even say that word? Uh, bless is a word that I confess I had used often as a pastor uh, for years before I really had grappled with what that meant, and, and for me to get a sense of what it means when we say bless. It was a German theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer who really uh, helped me understand. He wrote this about a, just shy of a hundred years ago. What Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote is, blessing means laying one's hands on something and saying, despite everything, you belong to God. And this is what we do with the world. We do not abandon it. We do not despise it. We do not condemn it. Instead, we call it back to God. We give it hope. We lay our hands on it and say, may God renew you, world created by God. That's what Dietrich had to say about blessing. And listening to that, it just, it clicked. It made sense to me. Right? To bless a meal, does it change the taste of the meal? What it changes is whose meal it is. Right? For now, we have to bless a meal is to lay our hands on a meal and say, like, well, not literally in the meal, but to, lay, to, to take a meal and say, this meal, we're going to offer it up for your plans, God. For it is good. You made it and we believe you can use it. And if we look at all the ways that 
Meals are used in scripture. Meals are used to, to feed people for the journey. It's used to create family and bring them together. Meals are used to make peace between people, right? To bless a meal is to take this meal and, and submit it to God and say, it is your meal, God. You are, you are gonna use it. We're, we're gonna offer it so you can use it for your purposes, for your plan. In the same way, like, we talk about praying for someone before surgery, like bless someone before surgery. Like if we're going to bless someone before surgery, it's not about making the scalpel sharper. It is about sharpening the mind so that we can perceive and see that God's will is going to be done. That all in all, in the end, all is going to be made whole and good. And if it is not made whole and good, then it isn't the end. Right? We pray God's blessing upon people before surgery so that we may be part, uh, we're, we're offering them, we're saying, this, you, are, you are God, this person, this person is God, and we're offering this person to your plan, God, and, and we trust that you're going to take them through this and, and take them one step closer to your, to your kingdom, right? Not one step closer to the wholeness and the redemption that is your plan. And so we think about the things that we call a blessing, right? When, when someone drops off food, it, it's a blessing, right? It is a blessing. It's a blessing. It's binding people together as, as community, as church, and it's beautiful, right? When someone brings good news, we call that a blessing. It is a blessing to hear good news that something that is building up what is good in the world has happened. Right? To name something as a blessing is to say that it is playing a part in God's plan is playing a part as being good news, that God's will is being done in this, in this thing on earth as it is in heaven. And that, that's a blessing. When Jesus delivers his longest sermon, he talks about blessing at, at some length. Right? And it sort of helps us think a little bit more about this. It's in Matthew 5, uh, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It is worth taking time to look at each one of those Beatitudes, they're called the Beatitudes, uh, the blessed are. Um, but overall, again, they continue to help us get this sense of what it means to say that someone is a blessing or someone is a blessed, right? To, to look at the poor in spirit, the mourning, the meek, the hungry, the merciful, the pure, the peacemakers, the persecuted, right? To call them blessed is to say that they are part of God's plan and that they are good and that they will be comforted. There will be a place that they will call home, that they will be shown mercy, that they will know God, right? That they have, and, and these things, these are in line with what God desires. In a sense, you could call this what we read at Jesus saying to Thomas as the last beatitude. Blessed are those who believe without having seen. And so we are left with this understanding that blessing, it's not mechanical. It does not change the nature of the thing blessed. Blessing is directional. It takes something. It names it as created by God, even if it is fallen, even if it is broken, even if there's a problem, it names it as fundamentally good and directs it back towards God, back in line with God's plan. And so, and so Jesus says of those who believe without having see, seen, all right, they are blessed, for they are directed towards God's kingdom. They are in line with God's desires. And that, my friends, is us. Blessed are we for this, what we are doing, is in line with God's plans. To be the people who gather for worship, to be the church that is sent out based upon this faith, 
There is nothing more important that we could be doing than simply this. Believing without having seen, and in doing so, knowing ourselves to be blessed. Thanks be to God. Amen. The prayer for this day is a touch different. My general approach to uh, having opinions about matters is to research and ponder and listen and speak once I am sure of my footing. It makes me nervous to say anything without being sure of my footing, and yet this week I don't know if that is possible. In the midst of a trial to, to determine if putting a knee into someone's neck for 9 minutes and 39 seconds, in the same city, another black man was shot in Minneapolis by a 26-year veteran of the, of the local police force who was in the process of training a new cop. Uh, that officer pulled a gun instead of a taser. This is the same week that in Chicago, a video was released of a, a shooting where, a, uh, again, a white officer shot a black male. Uh, this time it was a 13-year-old, a 7th seventh, seventh grader, who uh, in the video had his hands up while he was shot. Um, and as the, the police were responding to a 911 call, that shots had been fired, and they had been, but they had not been fired by this boy, this uh, seventh grader. Now these three uh, incidents are, are anecdotes. Anecdote is not data. City life is very different than rural life. There are always complicating circumstances. There are always people at extremes ready to respond at the slightest provocation to yell the most extreme point of view from one extreme of defund the police to the other extreme, which is a sort of thin blue line. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm nervous saying anything because I'm nervous about the terminology. It's a mess. If I wait to be sure of my footing, I will not say anything, and yet, I, and I just don't know what to say. What I do know is this, that the calling of a pastor is to live a private faith in public. Now that's, that's my job, to live a private faith in public for the good of those who would together, hopefully, learn to follow Jesus a bit better. And so the thing that I can do is pray. And so I will pray, and uh, this is my prayer in this moment, at this time. Lord, I struggle to be honest right now, for being honest would be to say that I'm glad I don't have to deal with this. And I don't want to deal with this. It's horribly honest, but I have a sense that I have enough on my plate, and I don't think I can deal with anything else. Yet your love is for all people, which means that this is a family matter. But that doesn't mean I know what to do or say. I don't know how we handle the scars of a past that I had no part in making, but I have inherited. I don't know what to do with the scars on the body of Christ in this nation. And so the only thing I can say to this day is to help me listen for I am not wise enough to figure it out by myself. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day and always.